Mankind has always made beautiful things. To be human is to create. And some of the most compelling art in the world has been made by some of its poorest people. This work has fascinated Western travelers and artists throughout history, and it fascinates me. Can traditional art survive the modern world? I'm off to some of the remotest regions on Earth to find out. In this film, to West Africa, to visit the Dogon people of Northern Mali, who still live in villages along the inaccessible Bandiagara Escarpment. I'm hoping to see what survives of their culture and their art today. If you believe in it as a powerful object, then that power belongs here. And I'll also be going south to Ghana to experience the power of contemporary art forms and discover how they play their part in modern-day Africa. A fascination with African art is nothing new to Europeans. The Duke of Burgundy bought an African idol from a Portuguese nobleman as long ago as 1480. Many of these masks and carvings have a sacred purpose. They were designed to be used in spiritual rituals and dances. They serve as objects of power also called fetishes, to communicate with the spirit world. During the making of this film, an African wood carving was sold by Sotheby's in Paris for a record price. It fetched over seven million dollars. Clearly, there's a strong desire for this work, especially the older pieces. But what does authentic in African art really mean? I'm going to start my journey in London. I've come to Hampstead to meet Andrew Chernievsky, who has an impressive collection of West African sculpture. What I notice, though, Andrew, almost immediately, is that there's a sense of uh, antiquity, age, to the pieces that you have? Yes, I suppose all collectors of certainly African art feel that age is important. I'm looking at pieces which haven't been touched by Western influence or colonial influence even. Right. These pieces are from mm. the Dogon country, which is Mali. Why are you attracted to Dogon art in particular? I think it's the soul quality of the Dogon which attracts me, and it's also their sense of form. I'd like to show you this, mm. because this piece is... Um, to me, it's an absolutely wonderful piece of art. This is the Dogon couple. It's said to be Bombo Toro, which is a particular style. It's the most extraordinary feat to be able to carve a piece like this. Out of a single block? Out of a single block. And do you know what it represents? It's said to represent all sorts of things, including the ideal coupling, which is twins. The fact that it's been used, is that an important thing? Yes. Uh, it, it has sacrificial offerings on it. It has blood. There's something very powerful about work which has had an important function. It gives it an extra charge. How long, when you saw it, did, you, did it take you to decide that you personally wanted to own this? Oh, this was... I, I had to look beyond the, the the state the piece was in, but fortunately I was able to see... I, um, about one or two seconds, essentially. <laughs> it doesn't really take long. It's I was the, expecting you to say, oh, well, you know, I went away overnight and thought, you know, but, but in, no, you in about to, one or two seconds you thought You don't have to think... I didn't have to think very hard about this 
This piece really, it's a wonderful piece of art. It is. But what made it? Do the Dogon people, their culture and their beliefs, the spirit that created pieces like this, still exist today? I'm traveling to the heart of West Africa to find out. My journey to Dogon country took me via Amsterdam to Bamako, the capital city of Mali, then north again on another flight to the river city of Mopti. The Niger, one of Africa's greatest rivers, has always been a life-giving artery, as well as a vital trade route in this landlocked part of Africa. In the 15th century, Islamic armies swept across this region. The Dogon felt under threat and fled to the cliffs of Bandiagara to preserve their way of life. Because a defeated people would essentially be sold into slavery. This river and one of the principal trades of this area was in slaves. Dozens of tribal groups and different cultures collide and coexist in Mopti. It's still a trading hub today. <laughs> At the city's taxi rank, I negotiate for a taxi brus, a bush taxi to take me the remaining 60 miles to Dogon country. In 2010, Mali celebrated 50 years of independence from France. French, however, remains the official language. My own French is, I'm afraid to say, not much better than when I left school. My taxi driver's name is Go. Our journey together out of the remote and arid badlands that border the Sahara helps me to understand how it's possible that the people here have managed to live so long without being disrupted by the outside world. Ça va? Okay. Goes just filling up with oil. And this is it. This is the Bandiagara scarp. It's a sort of gigantic wrinkle in the Earth's crust that runs for about 150 miles. We're in Dogon country. And this is where the Dogon came to hide about 700 years ago. So there are sort of people that time forgot. Or are they? Is such a thing possible? It's what I've come here to find out. Today, the Dogon, who number about three quarters of a million, are still very much a rural people, and they live in the numerous villages along this escarpment. Although it looks like something of an idyll, for much of its history, this region was a dangerous and violent place to live. Dogon villages built high up against the cliffs provided excellent fortresses against marauding slave traders and the advancing armies of Islam. Horse riders simply couldn't get up there. The Dogon came here partly to preserve their old beliefs. Traditionally, they were animists, and they believed that non-human entities such as animals, plants and rocks have souls and spirits. In Dogon culture, the supernatural is all around you. It's present, it dominates your life, and it's reflected in your art. Arriving in the village of Kundu, I discover that the art, too, is all around me. It's built into the architecture. Wooden doors and windows are carved with symbolic imagery. 
These are charms and totems designed to appease the spirits and protect what's inside the buildings. Bonsoir, bonsoir. Bonsoir, monsieur. <laughs> I've come to the traditional meeting place, a low ceiling structure called a togana, to pay my respects to the village elders. Je suis ici pour visiter uh, les Dogons. I found it. Oh, 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 wait. Whoa. <laughs> Every Dogon village has its own togana, and they're works of art in themselves. They're designed especially low to prevent anyone standing up and causing a rumpus during a meeting. The upright pillars are also intricately carved with symbols significant to each village. In the case of Kundu, it's the crocodile. The Togana have sculpture on it. Can you tell me what is the importance of sculpture for the Dogon? Bon, pour travailler le Togana, mm. c'est c'est ici il y a les artisans. Mm. Nos zones font les artisans. Nous même nos zones, nos zones, les zones du ce village travaillent. Kundu is a village of less than 40 families, and I gather that today virtually all the men here work as sculptors and carvers. I've got with me from London some pictures of the Dogon twins that I'm keen to hear the elders' views on. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Ça c'est c'est Telem, copie de Telem. Je ne sais pas si c'est. Copie de Telem. Oui, copie de Telem. Everybody is intrigued by Andrew's statue, although they come to no fixed conclusion on its origins or significance. But one word I hear repeatedly is Telem, and it sets me off on a new line of inquiry. Scrambling up the rocks to a cliffside village further along the escarpment, I'm following a path trodden by the Dogon for centuries, and also by a mysterious people who were here much earlier. Well, we've uh, we've climbed up above the Dogon village of Yugaduguru, which we can hear down below us, to find the remains of the Telem, and. In Dogon, Telem means as we found them. It's the people who were here on the cliffs before they arrived. These buildings here date from somewhere in the 12th century. They've been preserved because of the rock, and though they're only made of mud, the rains haven't got to them and they haven't been washed away. According to Dogon legend, the Telem were red-skinned pygmies, and nobody knows what happened to them. Perhaps because they were hunters and the Dogon were farmers, the pygmies disappeared and went down into the forest further south. But it's also believed that they may have simply intermarried and become one. But either way, there was an influence of the ancient culture on the new culture. And when people here look at Andrew's statue, they say, ah, tell them. It doesn't mean that it was made by the Telem. What they mean is that it was influenced by something very old. All around me, I can see evidence of people inhabiting this landscape from ancient times. The oldest cloth ever found in sub-Saharan Africa Funeral shrouds made of cotton in the 11th century were discovered in caves in the cliff. Apparently, a trade still goes on where people rope themselves up, dangle over the cliff and rob artefacts from unexplored places. The artefacts are then copied. Uh, the copy is shown to the customs and a certificate is issued and then the real thing is brazenly taken out of the country. It's difficult to survive at all in this unforgiving environment. Those smuggled artefacts were likely to be carved idols or charms designed to assist mortals in their struggles with the natural world. 
My arrival in Dogon country had coincided with an event vitally important to everyone who lives here, the annual harvest. We're harvesting millet here and it's very dry and the, the seeds are coming away already and millet makes beer, it makes cake and it makes porridge and um, this year is a particularly good year the harvest is uh, excellent there's plenty of millet but in the 70s 73 there was a terrible drought and at that point people started leaving these villages in large numbers and it was also at that point that the heirlooms the family antiques the old gods came out of the cupboard and onto the market It seems that recently, the forces of nature are combining with the forces of the modern world to bring changes to the Bandiagara escarpment. Ever since the French anthropologist Marcel Gruyol came here in the 1930s, the Dogon people have been observed and recorded by more anthropologists and academics than probably any other society across Africa. And yet there are still mysteries and huge areas of dispute amongst the experts as to the significance and meaning of many aspects of Dogon culture. Anthropology is, as they say, a tale of two cultures, that of the recorder and the recorded. And what is understood by the one can so easily be misinterpreted by the other. Noam Gwindo, however, is both an anthropologist and a Dogon. He studied the changes in tradition here, and he's interested in how one of the foundations of Dogon culture, the masked dance, is evolving. Masked dances are a quintessentially African art form that bring together sculpture, music and drama in one all-embracing experience. These dances keep the ancient myths and stories of Dogon culture alive for successive generations. Many of the masks in motion here are similar to masks you might find fixed to the walls of Western museums and galleries. But there is a huge difference because they only come into the, their full meaning if you're watching them in the form of a dance like this. Le porteur euh, du masque en fait a une certaine force vitale qui euh, les fibres qu'il porte avec la cagoule là également en bois. Et il y a tout ça, il y a tout ça, en tout cas une force vitale qu'on appelle le nyama. This dance apparently has its roots in the secretive nocturnal Awa funeral dance. The primary purpose of the dance was to lead the souls of the deceased to their final resting place. But Noam explained that what we were now seeing was in fact an adaptation, and that the dance was performed not at night away from watchful eyes, but in broad daylight, for outsiders and tourists. However, it's extraordinarily powerful. There's no doubt about that. What I'm seeing is something which has, for me, the great virtue of showing that you cannot really understand the art of this sculpture and these masks until you see this dance.
The masks have a brilliant, sharp, abstract quality. A bold simplicity of design that communicates on a visceral level. Anthropologists have recorded about 78 distinctly different mask designs, and it's a number that's increasing as new masks are made for the roles of new characters. In the 1950s, for instance, during the French colonial period, the character of the commandant or government official appeared. But Western interest in these masks and dances has, in a way, stagnated them. Tourists don't want to see the new masks, only the so-called traditional ones. And so a sort of heritage culture is beginning to be kept alive. Traditionally, dancers used to make their own masks. They made them away from the village in secluded caves, unseen by women and children. But today, things are slightly different, and masks are often made by professional mask makers. Merci. Parlez-vous français? Un peu. Un peu. Oui, oui. ça va. Mais, mais moi aussi. Ah, moi, ça me Mon arrivée. Mama du Guindu, one of the new professionals, has been making masks up here for the past 10 years. What Mamadou is making <clears throat> here is a mask, which he freely admits is for a, a tourist performance. And of course, the tourist performance is a, is a, has introduced a whole new realm to the carver's work. Previously, when he made a mask, he would go to a tree, he would offer sacrifices to the tree, it was very important to keep the tree a living thing, so he would only take a branch, but here the tourists are slightly changed. Oh, like. Oh, love For moi? Me? Moi? Logan. Well, okay. Yeah, it was very important okay. in the past okay. for a tree, for the life force of a tree to be preserved. Now, what's interesting here is I'm being allowed to make this as well, which, which in the past... Oh, <laughs> Mind your toe. Oh, oh, oh. It's not, I have to say, as easy as it looks. Boom, that is a year. Boom, that is a year. Oui. 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 I want to see this mask kit that I'm making in operation because I think it's going to have extra sort of detail holes in it that probably are not part of the original conception. There's a very um, a good story about somebody making a mask in Nigeria, and it was a very important sacred mask. Not a mask, I think it was just a statue. And as they're making it, somebody else, somebody else standing in the room goes, See, I can talk and do it at the same time. There's, uh, somebody else, somebody else is standing by and says, that's not, that's not the right, that's not right. You haven't got it right there. Bring it over here. And they hack a bit off it, and they change it. And everybody makes it to do the job that is required. The idea of authorship, which is our own sacred cow, is not quite as important in some parts of Africa as it is, shall we say, at the Royal College of Art. What? Oh. Oh. Wait, wait, oh, God! Wait! Oh, oh. 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 Wait, oh. 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 Magnifique. Now, um, you've worked uh, as an anthropologist here amongst the Dogon since 1989, and you are a Dogon yourself. What do you see as being the future for the Dogon? There are a lot of things in the culture that are in train of die. For example, the Dogon exists in a lot of villages. Today, there are a lot of villages that don't exist in Dogon. For the moment, the Dogon is in train of die in a mutation cultural. Sous l'influence de nouvelles religions, les études, l'exode rural, euh, les touristes, et puis quoi encore Il euh, bon, y a le trafic, ben, disons, le commerce, des choses comme ça en fait. Mais dans l'avenir en fait, bon, il y a un petit danger quand même, parce que la culture est presque en agonie. Mais le tourisme encore contribue en même temps euh, de revenir en tout cas sur la danse du masque. Noam's prediction that Dogon culture might be on the brink of extinction was a stark message that I may have arrived too late. Uh -huh.
do the belief systems, and the Dogon artists that created work such as this twin couple, still exist? We're on our way up here to meet a man who I hope will be able to help us because he's a man who has various skills. One of them is supposedly to be able to harness the power of magic. But the other is to make special statues. And obviously, Andrew hopes that his statue is special. Monsieur! Bonjour! The man I've come to see, Antuba Dara, is the local blacksmith. In Dogon culture, blacksmiths are revered and hugely respected because they're believed to have special powers. They can invoke rain, they're healers, and they have the almost magical ability of being able to conjure metal from the ground. <laughs> Dogon blacksmiths are by tradition also responsible for carving dege, sacred funeral statues made to appease the spirits of the dead. I asked Antuba how he goes about making a dege statue. What Antaba is explaining to me is it is necessary when making certain forms of statue to involve uh, Niyama, the great life force, in those statues. Partly because people are not as animist as they were, these statues simply aren't made anymore in the same numbers. But he made one recently for people in another village. And those people had heard of his capabilities, his, his creative impulses, the fact that he would do it correctly, making sacrifices here. And so they came to him to make it. We can't see that statue because it's an entirely private matter. But one of the key reasons I've come to Dogon country is to see if these special statues, the ancestor Dege, which are used as fetishes to communicate with the spirit world, are still in use. I now find out that, though now rare, they do still form part of Dogon tradition. The artifacts so prized by collectors such as Andrew are used during ritualistic sacrifices. And the man responsible for such ceremonies is the fetish priest. The sacrifice that we've just seen it is to ensure a good harvest next year. If it is successful, it will require another sacrifice of a goat or a sheep. In other words, the whole point of the sacrifice is whether it works or not. And the whole point of these statues is whether they work or not. They are not simply works of art or representations. They're objects with a spiritual purpose. And that's precisely what I've sat here and witnessed. Further along the escarpment, Ende, the village I've arrived in now, is quite different from the village I've just left. Most of the people here are no longer animists. They've embraced Islam. Ende built itself a new mosque only two years ago. Orthodox religions like Christianity and Islam have had a major impact on Dogon culture. As their influence spreads, traditional Dogon belief is either wiped out or repressed. 
I was taken by Abdullah to meet his uncle. Saidu Guindo is a Muslim, but he still works as a woodcarver. And apparently he too has some experience of carving Dogon funeral statues. When was the last time that you made a, a, a funeral statue, a dege, for anybody? The dernier dege that I made for the tradition, that was since before the past. It's for a view of a village on the plateau. Qui donne la commande. On fait avec tout, comme je vous ai dit, c'est pas avec n'importe quel bois. Euh, la culture d'Ogon, on ne le fait pas avec n'importe quel bois. Il y a des bois spéciaux pour les fétiches, il y a des bois spéciaux pour les masques. Mais maintenant, pour le tourisme, on fait avec n'importe quel bois. Nous, nous avons appris de nos parents, donc on fait toujours. Euh, les objets qu'on a appris, la manière comment on a appris avec les parents. Mais maintenant, nous essayons aussi de moderniser un peu pour le tourisme. Bon, c'est moins puisque euh, ici maintenant la population, la plupart sont devenus musulmans. Donc la culture, euh, le fétiche, il y a eu beaucoup de diminution. Oui. Nous, ils n'aiment pas, ils disent que tout, tout objet qui ressemble à la personne est prohibé, que Dieu ne veut pas ça. Mais nous, on le fait, mais l'islam ne veut pas laisser la tête. Oui. Pas du tout. Much of Dogon art is based on likenesses of the human form, forbidden, of course, by Islam. So I worry that Sedu's role as a carver in Ende might now be precarious. But his own pragmatic approach to life allows Sedu to separate his faith from his daily work. Abdullah tells me of a storeroom on the edge of the village, where I can see many now disused statues. Bon. Avant, donc les gens ils adorent ça comme le dieu. Ils vont arroser ça avec des poulets, soit avec, euh, avec un sèvre. Et une fois que tu as eu besoin de quelque chose comme des de, de héritages ou quelque chose comme ça, comme on prie aujourd'hui, comme on prie les dieux ou, ou Mohamed. Donc comme ça, avant, il n'y a pas de dieux pour le Dogon. Donc c'est ça que les dieux, on demande ça. Les anciens Non, ce n'est pas trop ancien. Oui. Là, il y a certaines sont copies qui sont faites. Et les autres sont 20 ans, les autres sont 15 ans, mais pas trop vieux. De maintenant, la religion, avec la religion, il y a beaucoup de musulmans, donc on n'utilise pas comme de dire ça. Maintenant, on, on fait ça pour, pour les antiquaires ou pour les touristes, oui. mais pas pour, oui. pas pour les dieux. There's no reason why recently made statues shouldn't be authentic fetishes with a long history of working for the village. But I somehow doubted that these were. I sensed they might well have been made with that antique dealer in mind. However, Abdullah tells me that though in this Muslim village it's forbidden to have an authentic sacred statue on display, they do still have one hidden away. So we've now come to ask the chief's permission to see this ancient fetish. Amen. Allô, bonjour. Le chef de village. Bonjour. Ça va Ça va. Ça va bien. Oui, merci. Bonne arrivée. Merci, merci. Merci, merci. We hope to come here to see mm. some of the uh mm. the old mm. ancient, uh, uh material. Mm. Oui. 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 C'est pas tellement obligé de, de, de prendre les photos ou des choses comme ça. Oui. Il y a eu beaucoup de concerns sur ce que vous avez fait. Et avant de vous montrer, il a dû consulter avec les plus jeunes. Parce que ces sont. Et c'est vraiment really important. Ces sont des objets secrets. Le but de ces objets est qu'ils sont gardés dans des endroits sacrés, loin de la communauté générale. Certain people aren't even allowed to look at them, uh, women in particular. So there's a there's a sense here that what we're what we're what we're looking at is something very very private, as well as uh, uh, as well as old and sacred. 
I was interested to know how old this carving was, and also, as Ende had converted so wholeheartedly to Islam, why the village still kept it. The essence of the figure is that that it's too old to know when it came into the possession of the village. And that, that reassures them that it's not a copy. I sense that at some point somebody will come to the village and say, let me take that off your hands and the village can have a new school or a new well or something that they really need given that this poor old chap doesn't work for them anymore. I don't want to encourage anybody to buy the work that the village preserves. Because it's part of their culture and somehow the very authenticity that people seek in it seems to me to be enough to say, well, if you think it's that authentic, you surely have to leave it where it is. If you believe in it as a powerful object, then that power belongs here. And to try and steal that power and take it away, whether it's in the name of art or because you want to show it to a museum as the real McCoy, it seems to me that its, it's home is here. Mariama. In Dogon country, I've seen a way of life and an art that's under immense pressure. Much of this culture now seems to be surviving as a sort of heritage Africa on display for tourists. And I worry that the Dogon are in some way sentenced to becoming a living museum. Time and history are actually finally catching up with the Dogon people. Because the big story in Africa today is the movement from rural Africa, like this, to the big city. <laughs> 700 miles due south and a far cry from the cliffside villages of the Bandiagara escarpment, I'm still in sub-Saharan West Africa, but now in Ghana's capital city, Accra. Not only do Dogon people migrate south, but their art too finds its way to the cities. And this is where my investigation into Dogon art takes on a new twist. Abu Bakar is a respected dealer in African artifacts. I meet up with him where he works in Nima district. In Ghana, we have this. good carvers. You yeah. can even carve a Dogon piece in here and make it old. This one is a, a Dogon door. Yeah. But made here in Ghana with a Dogon man. Mm. I can sell it as a copy price, mm. not a, an antique price. It's got lots of dirt, yeah. it's got cobwebs on it even, yeah. and yeah. it has a little bit of um, polish on it as mm. if people have been yes. rubbing against yes. it. Yes. Yeah. And you can see the one who has made the, like this one, the big one. Yeah. The big one. It was also a Dogon. But that one has made not more than in one year. This is the one I'm talking about. It's a fine thing. Yes, this is the one I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah. Here's the crocodile. The crocodile. The crocodile yeah. totem. Yes. Yeah. And this door looks like it was made. Well, made a hundred years ago, but in fact it was made. It's not more than one year. Maybe. One year old. Yeah, yeah. Abu takes me deep into Nima's maze-like back alleys, to where carvings, supposedly coming from other parts of West Africa, are actually knocked out right here in Accra. Am I okay to come, come in? Yeah, come, 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 come. The craftsmen have left before we get there, 
but I can see where they worked at aging artifacts. Those are some of the chemicals they used to make it, make it old. Yeah. So you can see. Yeah. Is there, Abu reveals is there, the trade for... secrets. He shows me chemicals used on the carvings so to age them and to make them more desirable to dealers, collectors, and I suppose to tourists too. What is it that they want from the old ones? What, is they see, what do they see in the old ones that if they, if somebody made a new one, what's the difference? It's a big difference because an old piece is like a, is like a magic. Someone who's deal on an antique. Yeah. It's always like to see an antique things. So when you see something's old, it starts to shake. It starts to shake because he love it. And it's different, but it's a new, he can never panic. But it's only, if he saw an old thing, an, an antique dealer, exactly when he saw it, it will panic. It's just to look at his face, it will panic. It's they just want. They it. just want the real one. They want the real the one. The real one. Everybody needs the real one. The real, the authentic, real authentic African, authentic African art. Reminded of Andrew's snap judgment when he first saw his Dogon couple, I want to know what Abu thinks of it. Okay, this is a, a very old Dogon piece. And I can see, I don't see, I, I'm not seeing it physically, but on the camera, yeah. I can see that it's old. Right. But to find out a piece whether it's old or not, you have to see it physically, hold it in your hand and see then you can tell whether it's an old piece or it's a new piece. Okay. But all, all I can know that is the work is beautiful. Do you think this piece, mm. was, do you think this piece could have been made in Ghana? No, we can make this kind of piece in Ghana, but it won't be the same carving as this. What do you mean it won't be the same? It won't be the same because the hand carving are different. It will be the similar, but the same thick is to be different. This one is really carved by Dogon. But we can find in the market here the same type, same carving, but different, different, you know, handwork. Because the, the way they, they cut the eyes, the eyes and the, the baby, you know, it's different with uh, someone who did it here. The exact significance of Andrew's twin couple still remains a mystery to me. The statue, nevertheless, seems to be authentic. It was most likely made and found its way out of Africa prior to any tourist trade in artifacts. In a gallery in downtown Accra, many other beautiful West African works are on sale. There are wonderful Dogon pieces too, a ladder and pillars from a Togona. But who really knows if these pieces are old or whether they were made yesterday? Does African art have to be created in a pre-colonial time warp to be authentic? Especially when so many original folk art forms are made here today. Fanti flags are rooted in Ghana. They're a terrific, exciting folk art that's uniquely African. This strip of Ghanaian coast is the Fanti people's traditional homeland and they're still the major ethnic group here today. Unlike remote and isolated parts of the interior, such as Dogon country, international influence has played a big role here since the 15th century. There was a trade with Europe on these shores before Europeans knew that America even existed. The Portuguese landed here in 1471. Later came the Dutch, the Danes, the Swedes and the British. It's no surprise, therefore, that Fanti art and culture has absorbed and reflects a connection with the rest of the world. Fanti flags are made and used by military units called Asafo companies. These militias were formed to protect their towns. And all along this coast, there are some remarkable structures that belong to Asafo companies called possibans. The Sappho companies use their possibans to store weapons, regalia and the prized company flags. 
The foundations of these possibans may be centuries old, but the structures are regularly rebuilt and re-sculpted, so their elaborate decorations deliberately keep up with the modern world. For me, these possibans are a folk art that's extremely sincere. And quite mysterious at the same time. And it's expressed in an enormously vibrant and, and exuberant way. There's no, there's no irony here. I find this whole presentation, this, this vibrancy, this graphic uh, exuberance, stimulating and, and ultimately very, very rare in the modern world. It's knockout, knockout stuff. The Sappho companies still thrive, not so much as fighting forces, but as groups with a ceremonial purpose. Fanti ceremonies use their traditional art to bring the community together. In the town of Cape Coast, I've been invited to witness the adoration of a baby girl, the daughter of an Asafo captain. Events like this aren't staged for the benefit of outsiders. They're an integral part of people's everyday lives. An adoration is a bit like a christening, but with better rhythm and more passion than I'm used to. Hello. 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 This is the baby who's this afternoon is being adored. And with good reason, I think, as you can see. What's the name of the baby? Mamyara. Mamyara. What a pretty name. Well, I feel I've adored the baby for long enough. I must give the baby... Who shall I give the baby to? Back to, back to the mother. <laughs> Vital to any adoration is not holy water, but two green bottles. One of Sprite and the other of Schnapps. This is drink. <laughs> At the head of all Asafo regiments is the company banner, energetically displayed by a flag dancer. The flags still made today are a feast of symbolism. This art form was developed to communicate status at a time when this society was comprised of so many languages and a high proportion of illiteracy. The designs are visual messages that have significance both to their followers and to rival companies. Much of the imagery is confrontational, aimed at provoking other Asafo regiments. Flags with a version of the Union Jack stitched into their corner give a nod to the British colonialists. And they've usually been made prior to independence in 1957. But the art of these flags isn't just a remnant of the past. Imaginative, witty new designs are still being made in Ghana today. Back in Accra, I met up with Amadou Baba. He's an art dealer and one of the city's major collectors. When I started 30 years ago, nobody thought about us have a flag. There until someone wrote a book about us have a flag. Then that's it. Even the kente. When I, I started buying kente, I could buy 50 kente in a day, 100 kente in a day. Now you can't buy kente. I mean, I, you hardly can buy one kente, I mean, a good one, once in a while. Kente cloth is worn by the Ashanti people at ceremonial occasions. These are old pieces but the cloth is still made in Ghana today. This are uh, kente commission in the olden day for a chief, for a special occasion. And this is another, and yes. the beautiful yes. colours yes. that yes. come yes. in. Absolutely yes. superb. Yes. yes. Absolutely superb. And everywhere you look... Yes. You this Ashanti ceremonial cloth is still a living art. And Baba reveals something even more modern and entirely new to me. Land of the dead. Fabulous. 
<laughs> These surreal, hyper-modern images, painted on the back of disused flower sacks, are advertisements for roadside video screenings. Odoko. Odoko. Odoko is a suburb of Accra. You see, is it? and if you look at other ones, we could see this one is a uh, Ashiyama. Ashiyama is also a suburb of Tema. This is handmade folk art from the streets and for the streets. What could be more authentic? Ultimate carnage, which is probably carnage. He kill people and eat, but this is the end of him. Pretty fantastic. We're quite a long way here from a, a village god in a shrine, in a cave, it, yes, in Dogon exactly. territory, aren't we? <laughs> Another equally astonishing street art is happening just a few miles away, on the other side of town. A number of carpentry workshops have achieved world fame for a craft that's quite particular to this area. The creation of fantasy coffins. Here at Hello Coffin Designs, Master and his assistants are hard at work creating a minibus casket for an ex-bus driver. So this, this is a, this is his bus. Yeah, it's not a big bus, like a, about three seats or four seats. In the past, the Gar used to make coffins in the shape of canoes. The Gar are an ethnic group who still live in and around Accra. But today, their fantasy coffins come in almost any shape you can imagine as long as it reflects the status and achievements of the incumbent. So this is what they look like yeah. after they've been painted up? Yeah. Yeah. Now we have uh, some uh, fish here, tilapia. Yeah. This is tilapia. Yeah. These coffins aren't designed to be kept in a cave and have libations poured over them. They're going to be buried. And along with their owners, they'll rot in the ground. But for a brief moment, they're paraded at a funeral and they're a celebration of Africa's new mythology that of the individual and of personal success. This is the living art of contemporary Africa. This is the lion. Now, in order to get a lion, Asafuache. Asafu. What does that mean? Like a group. I like see. Like a group leader. So he is a gang yeah. leader. He's, He's a, a gang, gang leader. leader. This yeah. is a gang yeah. leader's yeah. coffin. Yeah. Or this is a general or an air force commander's coffin. Yeah. You can't be a lion if you happen to be a feeble guy who who, who runs away from fights yeah. and uh, and runs a little corner shop yeah. or just or just does a little begging on the on the side. You have to be a lion if you're going to have yeah. a lion yeah. coffin. And how long, master? Yeah. Does it take to make this? Okay, like a, a lion. It's a uh, uh, hard work. Then maybe you can use about two weeks, five days. Two about, weeks, five so nearly days. three weeks. Yeah, about three what weeks. What happens to the Air Force commander or the gang leader uh -huh. during those three weeks? Maybe you can keep about the mortuary, the dead body. You can keep the dead body as a mortuary. Then after three weeks, then you can collect it. Oh, I see. So yeah. if you're uncle who is a, a, a field marshal dies you have to arrange to keep him in a mortuary in yeah. nice and cold yeah. for, for three for a month before yeah. the funeral will happen yeah. and you can parade this around yeah. Teshi and yeah. show and show what he was made of the any type you want you are professional give it to me i asked master what he thought my coffin should be he said he'd take some time to think about that this is one of the latest creators called Agozo. His works show how far contemporary Ghanaian artists have moved away from figurative representation. When I arrive at the city's main the art gallery to meet Nat Nuno Amofuteo, the former mayor of Accra, he's giving a talk on contemporary yeah, Ghanaian art. Reality. What fascinates me and uh, what, I, yeah. what I love yeah. is that you can come here and see things that people have Oh, made. absolutely. Our artists are now caught between a rock and a hard place. If you want to make a living as an artist, you create works that can be sold. Works that can be sold to, on a popular basis, means tribal-looking arts. 
But why is there that emphasis, do you think? Why is there that emphasis in, in museums, galleries, and across the world? Because, what they're trying to do is find trouble. Because trouble-able. they cannot take contemporary African art seriously. They cannot take a contemporary African art seriously. They all feel that the real art of Africa is what was around in the 1920s and 1930s. I mean, there's some great traditional African art, but we are in the 21st century, and we are trying to express the reality of the 21st century. So all these conspire to keep African art in that ghetto. But what excites me, still, yeah. coming to Accra, yeah. is the sense that what you see is people do still make things for of themselves. Course. People but... still do. And that's a wonderful thing. This is one form of art. But the real, uh, another form of art which is being created spontaneously is being done out there in the street signs, in the signs on the taxis, on the advertisement for hairdressing salons, which is plastered all over the city. I mean, the whole city is one art gallery. I came to West Africa to explore whether tribal art is still alive here. I found, amongst the Dogon, a lot of fascinating tradition and the residue of many ancient customs. But I'm not convinced that the belief system that created Andrew's Dogon couple really exists any longer. Statues like this, made sincerely for ritualistic use, may in fact be the last of their kind. Searching for Africa's untouched tribal past is now like chasing a mirage. But in Ghana, imagination and invention are everywhere, springing up sometimes in the most unexpected places across all parts of the community. Finally, I get a call from Master at Hello Coffin Designs. He said he had something to show me. Master! Yeah, boss. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> How wonderful. Look at that. It's got all the all the extra fittings. It's got a microphone and a wonderful telescopic lens. Master couldn't have made a better coffin for a television presenter because perhaps those most guilty of perpetrating the myth of a perfectly preserved Arcadian Africa must be the media, photographers and the TV camera. You're late. Bravo. (laughs) In first century Rome, the philosopher Pliny said, there's always something new out of Africa. He's right. Art's alive here and it kicks. Next time, I'll be travelling to the isolated plains of northwest India to seek out some exquisite textiles. Comedy tonight on BBC HD with Whites at half past 11. That's all part of our Friday night comedy kicking off after EastEnders next. (laughs) 